I think it's important to have these conversations early and often, <laughs> I like to say, um, with your parents or your partner and really be curious about what their wishes are. Seniority Authority exists to answer your questions on aging. The world has changed dramatically in a generation with more retirees than ever before, living longer with more choices. If you're an older adult or have an older adult in your life, where do you go to begin to understand those choices? I'm your host, Kathleen Toomey, with over a decade of work experience in retirement communities. I can track down the right people to answer your questions. So send your questions on aging to me, and together, let's get smarter about growing older. One thing I'm always asked whenever I meet people is, what is assisted living versus skilled nursing versus memory care? This is a topic that comes up constantly. And for those people who are just encountering the terms of senior living, it can be really confusing. So in today's show, in 45 minutes, we are gonna uncover everything you need to know about how to differentiate between these levels of care and how to know if your loved one needs these levels of care. Stay tuned and we'll break down some of the most basic questions I get on the topic of senior living. Thanks to our show sponsor, The Riverwoods Group, Northern New England's largest family of nonprofit retirement communities. We're active adults find community, purpose, and peace of mind. Visit riverwoodsgroup.org. Now let's hear from today's guest. Welcome to Seniority Authority. I'm your host, Kathleen Toomey. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most asked questions I get in this industry, explaining the difference between levels of care and how to know what level is needed. So many people are suddenly thrust into the task of decision-making and finding a community or a care partner that will provide care for their parents or loved ones, yet they don't know where to begin. Well, bookmark this show as we are going to help you figure that out and create a blueprint for what to do. Today's guest is my dear friend and colleague, Cindy Martin. Vice President of Quality for the Riverwoods Group, which is Northern New England's largest family of continuing care retirement communities. Cindy is a registered nurse with more than 30 years experience in the healthcare field in a variety of settings the past 15 years at Riverwoods, where she has set the standard for nursing within three communities. She currently leads the quality efforts within the Riverwoods Group including maintaining state and federal quality guidelines and as our lead on clinical response to the pandemic. You can actually blame this whole podcast on Cindy because she's been my go-to person for all things clinical for the last few years. And for many years, she's been helping me to provide information to others who are looking for answers. So I get the questions I go to my smart friend, Cindy, she gives me the answers and I tell people. So Cindy is one of the inspirations for this podcast to try to bring this kind of information to everyone. So finally, after years of thinking and talking about this, welcome to the podcast, Cindy. Thank you, Kathleen. Happy to be here today. Both you and I know that, unfortunately, people are often thrust into a situation where they need to know a lot about a topic they rarely think of, and quickly. And yet, there's a significant misunderstanding about just the levels of need within what we call long-term care. So let's just start at the beginning. There are several levels of long-term care programming. Can you explain each level for us? 
Well, sure. You know, again, thank you for inviting me to talk about this today. These are, you know, tough um, topics, I think, to tackle. And I'd like to tell you that these questions often have a concrete black and white answer. But I think that you've known me long enough um, to know yes. that the answer is often it depends. Um, and that's why I think it lends to some confusion and misunderstanding. So with that said, I will certainly try to do my, my best to paint a picture. Um, the difference in levels of care are generally based on a few things. Um, licensure, the range of care and services that are offered, and the complement of staff that are needed to provide that level of support. So let's start with assisted living, which is you know kind of under the long-term care umbrella. Um, and assisted living is licensed at the state level. And this means that the rules and range of care and support and services that are provided may um, differ very much from state to state. But an assisted living typically provides supportive services for those who need some level of assistance um, with activities of daily living. And I guess I should explain. Yeah, I'm going to stop you right there because so yeah. many of our reference points are called these activities of daily living. Can you break that down for our listeners? Sure. So activities of daily living are really what we do to kind of get ready and move throughout the day. Um, so it, it entails um, uh, bathing, dressing, grooming, and hygiene. Um, also how, um, you know, one uh, might be mobile, how they transfer, you know, in and out of a bed or in and out of a chair. Um, and it also involves things like meal prep and housekeeping. And there are also um, what we call instrumental activities of daily living that I think aren't talked about very often. But those are the things that we um, generally, uh, you know, tackle on a daily basis, you know, uh, paying the bills and, um, you know, calling for oil and managing the checkbook, basically management of the household. So in act activities of daily living and in assisted living, really, you know, we're managing the household for you, but we're providing care and support so that you can manage those personal activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, grooming. Um, and at, sometimes um, it might be transfer of locomotion, you know, around um, a household. Does that help clear that up a little bit? It does. It does. So what you're saying is um, the activities of daily living, those things that help us get up and get going uh, for our day. When somebody needs help with those activities, bathing, dressing, grooming, transferring out of the bed to standing, that's when they may need what's called assisted living. And is that always an in-home? Uh, is that always living in a community or can that be done at home? So it, I'm going to say it depends. You're going to hear me say that. You're going to hear me say it's that. It's a familiar a refrain. A familiar refrain for sure. Um, so it really is dependent upon um, what the individual needs and the frequency of, um, of need. And it also is dependent upon the resources available. So whether that be resources from family or somebody who is hired, or it may be financial resources. So for someone who, let's say, um, is at home and, and managing well, but needs a little bit of physical help with showering, or maybe they need a little bit of um, help with prepping a meal. That might be something that one can hire for episodically, um, but when you have an increased need throughout the day and you're, you need some level of oversight or support or care for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, that is typically when somebody needs to be you know, within a facility and receiving those services. Not always. Um, because one might have the resources to actually implement that at home. It's not easy to do, though. Um, certainly, it's cost prohibitive, and it certainly um, requires a very dependable um, network of support to manage that. So when I say it depends, it really is there's a lot of factors to consider here, um, not only just what the needs are, but what the resources are to meet those needs. That makes sense. And I think it also makes sense based on do you need one to help with one activity of daily living, two activities, three activities, or how much can you do? And this is, again, to keep you safe um, and healthy and clean, et cetera. So, so that's assisted living. That really makes sense to me, and hopefully it makes sense to our listeners. Um, 
Let's move on to memory care. Okay, so with memory care, um, again, a little bit of a tricky tricky topic here. Um, It often can be provided within an assisted living, uh, sometimes within, within an actual nursing care, nursing home. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because not all states have specific requirements or licensure or certification for memory care. And I think that's often very surprising to folks. Um, but the last time I checked, there were only about 16 states that actually required licensure or certification to provide, to basically hang a shingle and provide memory care. So can we just stop here and tell me, from a practitioner's standpoint, what does that say to you? What is, when you say there are very, there are some states that have no guidelines for memory care, what does that, what concerns does that raise in your mind? Well, I mean, I think if I were a family looking at this um, or a partner looking at this, I think I would be concerned that those who don't have a license, a state that does not require a license, means that the care is not proficient. Um, however, as a practitioner, I know that's not necessarily the case. Um, really, you know, memory care is, there isn't any magic to it, if you will. It's really about providing an environment um, and an approach and programming that is um, caring and compassionate and patient and flexible. And, you know, certainly there are things that one wants to look for. You want in an environment of care for, um, for the environment to be really um, calm um, and secure um, and provide for wayfinding for those who have, you know, um, some limitations in finding their way maybe back to a room. Um, but, you know, it, it really is much more predicated on the approach of the caregivers um, and their ability to know the person, um, their routines, their preferences, to know them deeply and to honor those and to understand that when um, those routines change, because they often will, um, that there needs to be a level of flexibility um, and that they have to be compassionate around that. And, and when there are behaviors, that they need to be curious about those behaviors. A little bit of a detective. What is that person trying to tell me um, so that I can meet that need? So, you know, it, it's, it's really very much more, in my mind, not so much about the licensure certification. I mean, those, those, those are great to have um, if, it, if it sets a standard for what is needed. Um, but I do think that there are plenty of states that are in, you know, New Hampshire is one of them. Um, that is providing memory care in um, homes, households, communities, um, and, and doing it well without having license certification because they know what to provide and what is needed. And that is the right environment and the right approach and the right programming that is going to meet people individually where they're at and provide meaning and purpose. And that's going to look different for each person. So it's not really cookie cutter. You know, it's, it's not about having a program that meets everybody's needs because everybody's needs is going to be a little bit different. And uh, we could spend, and based on how our audience responds, we may come back. We could spend an entire episode just talking about memory care and all of the new programs and tools that are out there because as more people... Um, nationwide are developing memory issues and uh, various forms of dementia and Alzheimer's. There's a a corresponding, I think, increase in number of programs and creative ways to um, reach people, as you were saying, um, to help us out. So that's an exciting, exciting chapter in this, in this industry that we can perhaps come back to. Sure is. But just going through the the basic levels, now we have (laughs) something that I know is one of your favorite topics, uh, which is the strangely named skilled nursing, uh, which is just a bane to everyone's existence because uh, the very topic skilled nursing as a level identifier uh, presumes that no other nursing is skilled, which I would, yes. uh, I think it, the, dev- the government has done a, a tremendous disservice to all nursing professionals. But nonetheless, we're here to talk about the topics that are in the local lexicon. And the local lexicon, 
understands assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing. So can you take us through why it's called skilled nursing and how it differentiates? I could surely try. Um, so, so first of all, skilled nursing starts with um, actually having a nursing home license. So you have to have a state nursing home license um, and then choose to be a Medicare participating provider. Um, and you certainly need to make, meet the conditions of participation, um, which means some increased regulatory burden. But really, a skilled nursing facility, um, you're, you, you nailed it. You said it's the bane. It has been the bane of my, my existence for many years this term. Uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services basically coined this term um, skilled nursing many years ago, and it truly uh, represents an insurance benefit for Medicare beneficiaries. That's really all it means. Um, it is a term of reimbursement. So essentially, it means that Medicare A, if you are a, you have a nursing home license in your state, you've decided to become a Medicare um, uh, provider, you can bill for the services under certain conditions for a very short period of time. So, okay, so it but, is truly a Medicare reimbursement term, yes. and it connects to is this facility licensed as a nursing home, and are they meeting the Medicare burden of criteria? And, and for those who are receiving those services, um, you know, it's predicated on a number of conditions. So you have to have three days of an overnight qualifying stay within a hospital. Obviously, you need to be a, um, a Medicare recipient. And your doctor, your provider needs to determine that you have a daily need to have um, nursing and rehabilitative services. Um, and, and under those conditions, Medicare will pay for your stay um, under the Medicare A benefit for up to 100 days. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean 100 days automatically, but providing that you need that daily care, um, they will pay a portion or 100% up for the first 20 days of that stay in that nursing facility. So interestingly, this term has more to do with the predicating event than it does on the nursing that you receive. So just so I can reiterate what you said, make sure I have it correct. In order to benefit from a skilled nursing reimbursement through Medicare today, and it may change in the future, today you have to have a three-night qualifying hospital stay, which means you have to be overnight as admitted, not yes. under observation. That's an important clarification. And then your physician has to say, yes, this person would benefit from a skilled level stay. And if you've had the three nights and the physician referral, then you can go to a facility and get up to 100 days of care classified as skilled nursing um, that will be covered by Medicare. Absolutely. Yeah. And it'd be the same. So I think this is an important point, too, that, you know, you may be admitted to a nursing facility under a skilled nursing benefit. And there are others who are living within that nursing facility receiving receiving the same care and services um, from the same team of professionals, but they just didn't have that qualifying stay. They may be there for long term care. So it really is about the reimbursement, not as much as the care provided. There are certainly conditions that, um, as you say, predicate, you know, um, coverage. So you do have to have a need. It might be wound care, IVs, um, you know, post-operative care, physical therapy, occupational therapy. But all of those things can still be provided whether you are a skilled nursing facility or not, it really comes down to the reimbursement of it. And a benefit, certainly a benefit to those who are receiving the care of having their medications covered, um, having rehabilitation services covered, you know, um, and the room and board covered. But um, it's only for a certain period of time, up to 100 days for a spell of illness. So... I think the the larger perception here in the general population is that skilled nursing is 
more comprehensive than assisted living, that you have a higher level of nursing care. Can you comment on that? Sure. So I think you have a higher level of of nursing need. Um, I wouldn't say it's a higher level of nursing care. Um, okay. All the nursing that you're going to receive, in my mind, um, is skilled um, and sufficient to meet you where you are at. Um, but somebody who is um, is in a, a facility for a skilled nursing benefit, um, it is a particular spell of illness or acute period where we are trying to heal a wound, we are um, trying to rehabilitate from a fractured hip, um, it's a post-operative, you know, um, event, somebody who's recovering from pneumonia and maybe needs some specialized attention for a short period of time. Um, that said, you can be residing in a, in a nursing home and not have a three-day qualifying stay and have a pneumonia <laughs> um, or have, have a, um, a post-operative wound that um, maybe didn't keep you in the hospital for enough days. You know, it turns out, you know, um, total knee replacements happen pretty much overnight. Some people are it's absolutely true. You know, it used to be you're in the hospital for a week. Um, and I remember those days. Um, and it was a very long recovery process. And that's not really necessarily the case now. A lot of folks, um, sometimes it's a day surgery even. And so they don't actually meet the qualifications, but may still have the benefit of having, you know, a nursing home stay for, for that wound care um, and mobility needs. Um, so it really comes down to, um, I don't think more nursing care, um, it's you're providing care based on what the needs are. The skilled nursing piece is really just a reimbursement term. Okay, that really makes a lot of sense. Now comes the question that I have asked you over and over again, because I have gotten the question over and over again from my friends who say, okay, my mom needs assisted living. What's a good place and how do I figure it out? So you may be an adult child who's suddenly realized that your parent needs needs long-term help. They mm -hmm. are not succeeding at home on their own or with their partner. And now comes a time where you have to find assisted living. And generally, you have to find it quickly. And generally, you're also doing other things like holding down a job or raising your own kids, you know? <laughs> right, right. People are trying to always find the shortcut. So they come to me and I come to you with the question of how do I know if it's a good place? Yeah. So um, so a, a, few, a few thoughts on that. I, I mean, first and foremost, if you are, you, you need to know what it is that they need. Um, you know, you be prepared and, and kind of be organized as to what the needs are of your of your parent or your partner. Um, and then you can understand what level of care you are looking for, um, whether you're looking for maybe some in-home support versus assisted living versus an actual nurse um, nursing care um, home. And if it is if it is a nursing home um, that is Medicare certified, there is a, um, a star rating, if you will, from Medicare. Medicare a offers star. a five-star rating. Oh. And you can find that by um, simply Googling nursing home compare. And then you can, you know, put in any zip code and, you know, you know the area that you're looking for and, and find the homes that will provide those level of services in your area. So that's a, that's a good place to start. Nursinghomecompare.gov. And then you put in your zip code and then you can call up the different facilities and look at their Medicare rating. You can look at their Medicare rating and it's going to give you an overall rating of five stars, five stars being the best. Um, and it really is a um, combination of how that home has done in um, past clinical surveys. How are they doing it meeting that stringent you know, criteria for being a Medicare provider? So when the surveyors come in um, and kind of examine the records and the environment of care and the approach, how are they seeing it? And it's also looking at the staffing levels, which are incredibly important. 
um, because obviously the higher staff to resident ratio, the more individualized care you know that you can provide. And then lastly, it takes a look at the quality measures of the home. So every Medicare participating home has to provide um, a tremendous amount of data um, on, on the residents that they are caring for. And that is compared within the state um, as well as nationally. So it provides you some benchmarks to really look at to see, you know, how is this home doing compared to another home? This may be down the road a bit. And it gives you an overall star rating. Now, it's good to look at that, but I don't think it's the only thing to look at, um, you know, because I, I think it's important when you when you do take a look at that, um, that five-star rating um, that is available, that you have to kind of look at it in some context. And you might need somebody to help point out what that means. Um, you know, lower staffing, low quality measures, those, those are pretty indicative. However, there are certainly some very good homes um, that may have a survey and they find one or two things um, that are um, fairly benign, but don't look, don't look so much when you actually are looking at the website comparing. So I, and I think that some of our listeners may not know that nursing is the second most regulated service in the country, second only to air traffic controllers. So when <laughs> when Cindy says a lot of data, and she is a data guru, she is not kidding. Uh, I uh, nurses have to note every single thing they do, every single uh, pill they give. If they find a resident's glasses and put them and forget to put them on their face, that's you know, a ding for a plan of correction that you have to make yes. sure the glasses are on their face. It, it's mind boggling. So um, kudos to yeah. everyone who is in nursing for not only doing what they're doing, but then also um, participating with this gargantuan amount of data. So anyway. That- well, well, thank you for pointing that out. I, yes, I, I do recall receiving a deficiency one time for um glasses that were on the face however it didn't right it wasn't written that the glasses were on their face so that became the deficiency so I, I think sometimes you know if if you're the you know the consumer and you don't have experience um, you know with this level of care then it's sometimes hard to kind of delineate what is um, just regulatory burden and something that's pretty benign versus something that's of you know of consequence so I would never look at it in a vacuum. Um, it's important to actually visit the home, visit the community, the facility, and really get a sense of what they're all about. Is it clean? Is it warm? Is it welcoming? How are the staff approaching the residents? How are they approaching you? Um, you know, what is the level of staffing? I think that that is a very good indicator, um, you know, for a staff to resident ratio as to, you know, whether they have the resources they need to really provide um, care in an unhurried way and a person-centered way um, and in a meaningful way. So I would never just look at the nursing home compare. So I love that person-centered care, and that's an industry term that is talked a lot about within our industry, but our listeners may not um, be familiar with what that means. Can you illustrate what you mean when you say person-centered care? Sure. I I think it really comes down to, you know, I think about it as who's driving the bus. Um, You know, are are we setting routines and schedules based on what is um, convenient and and efficient um, for the staff? Is it institutional? Or are we setting um, the routines and schedules and preferences and choices on the actual person? Are, are they making those choices? Are we asking them? Are we partnering with them? And even better, are they directing us? <laughs> we shouldn't have to ask. They should just tell us um, what it is you know, that they want and need. Um, and we do our best to honor those preferences. Um, so whatever it is that maybe you were doing at home, you should be doing um, when you live within an assisted living or a nursing facility. Um, all of those um, individual daily life routines and choices should be honored um, to the extent possible. So if you like to get up late, 
perhaps that would be me. Um, yes. Then uh, if you want to stay up late at night and get up late in the morning, you that should be honored. You should have breakfast when you wake up, not mandatory breakfast when it's convenient for the staff. Absolutely. So it requires a lot of flexibility. You know, it requires flexibility, you know, in the nursing approach, but also in the dining approach that regardless of what time you get up, that that's when you can have breakfast. Um, or maybe, you know, you're, you know, you kind of like to be late to bed um, so that you can have a dinner a little bit later um, or earlier if you desire. And with activities too, that there are different individual and group activities um, that are available and meet your needs. And if there isn't something, then we're going to partner with you to find out what that is and, and, and help make that happen. I love that idea. And I think it's important for our audience to know that that as you look through these kinds of communities, understanding what the level of activities are and understanding also what your parent or your partner may want or not want to do. I think oftentimes the adult children want a day packed of activities and the person who is there does not want that same level. Have you, have you run into that, Cindy? I have, I have. I'm, I'm kind of laughing because I'm thinking if I only had a nickel um, for every time, you know, somebody wanted, you know, um, you know, mom or dad to build a birdhouse, you know, and, uh, and paint it. I'm like, well, that's really not what mom or dad really wants to do today. So it's very important to be based on um, what the individual wants, not what you want for them. Um, and to understand that their, their, their desires and choices may change. Um, and it may not be what they've always enjoyed to do, to do, uh, but what they what they enjoy doing today, and that might be you know based on you know um, you know cognitive limitations or physical limitations. But if you are always an avid gardener, um, then you should garden. But you know if you are wheelchair bound, then let's make sure that we have raised beds so that you can garden and you can still enjoy that activity. Um, you know if there maybe were. I don't know, certain, you know, um, cognitive games that you enjoyed. Let's make sure that you can do those in a way that you still feel successful. One of my favorite examples of of your team helping to create this is the gentleman whose name we won't mention, who is a very agitated and he was a former business owner. Can you tell that story? Because I think that is brilliant. I know this is your favorite, I think. Um, this, so- this and the next one that I'd like you to talk about, which is a, which is the woman who likes to shop, which is going to be me oh, in a gosh, few yes, years. Yes. Yes. So, so, yes, we will keep the names out. Um, we did have um, a gentleman who um, was a bit busy, um, kind of wandering the unit in an areas that others maybe always didn't enjoy, um, you know, him, um, him visiting. And so he had actually run a business, um, had a lumber yard. And so what we wound up doing was uh, try to recreate a space that was his office and the family brought in like pictures um, from his office and, you know, the old wooden pencils and things that would be tickets, things that would be meaningful to him. Um, We had a phone there because he was often on the phone conducting business. And so that was an area that we could kind of redirect him to um, when he was kind of particularly um, antsy. And it was it was kind of amusing because they were, that worked for a while, and then there were times where we'd say, "Hey, um, you have a phone call," and he'd say, "Tell him I'm too busy. I can't take the call right now." <laughs> so it didn't always work. So you know, it just kind of goes to show you have to have some level of flexibility when you're planning these, uh, uh, you know, kind of planning out these interventions. But creating that space that was filled with things that he remembered and a desk and a phone and a pad so we could take down orders for lumber that just gave him that sense of purpose and yes. and calmed him yes it did it did and i i think that takes deep knowledge of the person as you were saying earlier that the staff needs to know who the person is and who the person was um because understand who you're dealing with. And I think that's really important in this in this field is understand the person who's coming to you, the sum total of who they have been. 
um, and recognize and treat that person with dignity and respect. Absolutely. And taking that knowledge and, you know, and applying that to today. Um, And, you know, that sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. So you have to meet somebody where they're at. And that's really important, too. But um, I think being a detective to find out those things are um, important. As you mentioned, we had a um, another um, resident who just really enjoyed shopping, um, which was, what do you do with that? Um, but we had some great staff who decided to put up a little, you know, kind of um, mobile shop, and and it was pocketbooks and costume jewelry and dresses and. Um, boas <laughs> and everything you could have mentioned because she was a snappy dresser. And we had a lot of residents who um, who donated materials to this and it became yeah. a traveling boutique, really. And, and honestly, I think she was much more interested um, um, in telling others what they should be wearing um, from the shop <laughs> than for herself. So, you know, yeah, yeah. So if you stood there too long, you'd wind up with a red feather boa around you. But, uh, <laughs> um, but it was great fun. That's fantastic. I think that yeah. is is wonderful. So you've you've given us some guidelines to consider when we're trying to find a place like this. One is to go to the Medicare.gov um, site if it's a Medicare certified facility. Um, but if it's not, to you know, nothing compares to boots on the ground going into the communities and seeing how you are um, welcomed or not and asking about um, the staffing ratio. Um, What other things would you ask in order to learn their approach other than the staffing ratio? Sure. Um, Other than the staffing ratio, I think it would be just kind of important to understand what is their philosophy of care? You know, how do they approach um, just kind of the daily routines of folks? You know, is it person-centered? Is it person-directed? Um, or does it have a much more institutional feel? Um, so that's important to kind of, you know, take a look under the covers there. If it is not, whether it is or it isn't a, a Medicare certified facility, even just an assisted living facility, then you can ask to see their last survey results. You know, so that's certainly something right. important to you know, ask if they would provide a copy or let you look at. They, they should be posted within the facility for you to see anyway. Um, so you can certainly ask to take a look at that. Um, I do think, you know, it's important to understand what activities or what programs are being offered. Very often there'll be a calendar, um, or there should be, um, a calendar that is provided that kind of gives you a sense of what the month looks like. And, you know, if you're taking a look at that and you see things that you don't think that your parent or partner would enjoy, um, then ask them, then, then what? You know, um, you know who, who decides on what the activities are? Are the residents involved in those decisions? So you want to really get a sense of, again, who's driving the bus? Um, it is the resident's home. You know, the caregivers, you know, or care partners are just working there. Um, but it is the resident's home. And you want to make sure um, that the residents have a voice and they have choice in what is actually happening. Um, within that home. A resident, the resident voice and the resident choice. Yeah. Um, Can I ask you, would you ask about staff longevity and staff training? What kind of specific training they've had, assuming it's not a Medicare facility? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, it's it's a tricky thing with longevity. I think longevity is is great um, until sometimes it isn't. (laughs) Um, You know, and the reason I say that is just that I think that there is some, you have to expect that there's going to maybe be some built-in um, turnover. Sometimes it's, you know, um, students that are, you know, um, working, you know, as a caregiver until they complete their college courses. Um, we have had some great folks who are pre-med, um, who are going on to be, you know, a rehab therapist, um, or, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, degrees where folks are, are moving on. And, and so you're going to expect that they're going to have some turnover, but you do want to have a sense that, that, that there is um, some longevity of staff um, and you do want to um, have an idea about how they're training their staff. You know, does anybody hold um, any special certifications? Um, you know, how do they train for dementia? Right. Especially I think when it comes to 
dementia yeah. memory yeah. care. And, and I, you know, I think that the good news there is, you know, on the Medicare front, that has become a required um, training. Um, and I, I have certainly seen that uh, within New Hampshire um, on the assisted living. It's kind of, you know, it catches up, you know, and the, the folks who are not certified by, by Medicare that are nursing homes or assisted livings, they are required to do a level of training. That might look different from state to state again, um, but you'll, whether it is required or not, you want to understand if there is an investment in that area um, of training, you know, in dementia care, um, behaviors and approach and environment. And then um, what do you think about the difference when you're choosing two communities between a for-profit and a not-for-profit? Oh, well, um, I have worked for both. <laughs> Um, and I, I would say that I, I think that a not-for-profit very often devotes more resources to direct patient care. Um, it's not always the case. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Um, but I think not-for-profits um, not are very clear um, in tying um, all that is done to their mission. You know, at Riverwoods, it is very clear to us that our mission is to provide community and peace of mind. So that's really our compass for everything we do. So I think there's often a much greater um, tie to the mission and, and the resources that are um, um, provided uh, to actually do a good job and for folks to feel like they have positions where they'd be successful in providing good care. That happens in for-profits as well. Maybe not always. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to, to understand too. I think this has been really, really helpful um, to, to break down the levels of care, what the activities of daily living are, how do you find a good place, whether it's Medicare services, service, Medicare um, or not. Um, do you have any final words for folks who are going out there and, and looking at these different communities? Any other words of advice? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's important to have these conversations early and often, <laughs> I like to say, um, with your parents or your partner and really be curious about what their wishes are um, for care as they age, what is important to them, not necessarily what is important to you, but what is important to them, because that might look different. Um, and also be honest about your limitations um, as well. Um, I think very often families get themselves into a position of, you know, we're going to provide care for you at home um, because that's what you want. And it gets to a point where it surpasses their limitations and they have become the caregiver and not the adult daughter um, or son. Really? Really, really. Um, so it's really important to kind of know where those lines are um, because it really can create a difficult dynamic when they start to cross. Um, you know, I think it's, as I said, better to research what your options are um, rather than being caught by surprise. Um, you know, I, Kathleen, you often say, you know, choose your change. And I think that that is really good advice. Um, I also like this one. Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure he was not talking about long-term care, but I think it's <laughs> awfully good advice to follow. That is great advice. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. Yeah, yeah. That that's awesome. And in our in our podcast, we have we spend a lot of time about how to have that conversation, uh, either kids with your parents or parents with your kids. And you're right on target. The sooner you talk about it, the better. And keep revisiting because you know your opinions change. And well, yeah, yeah. You have to revisit um, because they may not be ready um, or you may think you're ready and you're not. You know, I, I, you know I, I've been doing this for over 30 years and I know that <laughs> the first conversation I had within my family was met with, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I thought, well, let me rephrase that. And it was met again with, I, I really don't know what you're talking about. I thought, well, I think I'm being pretty clear. Um, so it was very apparent that it wasn't the right time. Um, so I had to come back to that, you know, kind of gently in different ways. 
And and I think I remember your advice is seize the natural oppor- naturally occurring opportunities to have a conversation. If yeah. some friend of your parents or your loved one has an experience or goes into a community and they have a reaction to that, turn that into, oh, is that something you'd like or is that something you wouldn't right. like? And and just, I think, you great advice. Be curious. Um, be curious and start thinking about it because it's going to happen to all of us at some yeah, point. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of tee those conversations up as, you know, so when and if... Uh, <laughs> You always want that if. Uh, when and if this happens, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything that I can to honor what your preferences will be. Um, and, I, and I think that, that that's helpful. Yeah, and I, because again, I think that way of framing the question puts the parent or the partner in the driver's seat. As you keep right. saying, they need right. to be in the driver's seat. So if you're not going to share what you want, we can't execute that. You have to right. tell us what you want in order for us to be able to provide that to you. Absolutely. This has been fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, Cindy. It's uh, been really enlightening. And I hope that this episode spurs a lot of questions uh, because if it spurs a lot of questions, that means I get to have you come back. <laughs> you thought you were one and done, but no, my friend. <laughs> I know where you are. Um, so um, so thank you very much to Cindy Martin, Vice President of Quality at the Riverwoods Group, for going over today the understanding of what is assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing And um, please send your questions about this topic to me at senioritiauthority.org. And if we have enough questions, we can have Cindy come back. That's our show for today. If you enjoyed it, please visit our website, senioritiauthority.org, to submit questions for future episodes and watch archived episodes. Spread the word, visit us on Facebook, and subscribe on your favorite podcast site. Thank you to our sponsor, the Riverwoods Group, including Riverwoods Exeter, Riverwoods Manchester, and Riverwoods Durham, providing community, purpose, and peace of mind to older adults. Until next time, get smarter and enjoy your chance to grow older. Thanks to our show sponsor, the Riverwoods Group. Northern New England's largest family of nonprofit retirement communities, where active adults find community, purpose, and peace of mind. Visit riverwoodsgroup.org. That's our show for today. Did it spark a question? If so, send us your questions at senioritiauthority.org and we'll track down the answer. Meanwhile, Don't forget to subscribe, like us on Facebook, follow us on YouTube, and rate us on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, let's get smarter about growing older.